Great, so I think we're ready to get started. Um, we're going to be talking today about how to value a mobile gaming studio, or at least provide a framework to do so. Um, <clears throat> so my name is Martin McMillan, I'm the CEO and founder of Pollen VC, uh, based in London. Um, what we do uh, as a company is provide uh, credit facilities to uh, mobile gaming studios to help them scale. Um, one of the things we invest a lot of time into is trying to improve the financial literacy of founders. So um, we create a lot of content, calculators and so on. So we believe that when you understand the financial dynamics of user acquisition, um, provided metrics are good, then that can be a significant factor in uh, helping to unlock um, scale. Uh, so our funding typically sits alongside venture capital funding. Uh, Non-dilutive as part of the capital makes you have some equity and some debt, um, <clears throat> depending on how good your user acquisition uh, equation is. So in terms of um, valuing or how a framework to value a mobile gaming studio, we're going to go back to um, a, uh, I very much remember my very first economics um, lecture at St Andrews. Where, university where I was taught the first principle of value, and this was my very first, um, very first lecture. Something is worth what someone's prepared to pay for it. Simple as that. Uh, if someone's not prepared to pay that particular price, it's just a theoretical kind of valuation. But unless someone's prepared to stump up a check, then you know a business isn't isn't worth it. So let's look at what has happened over the last <clears throat> two and a half years. And um, what's happened is that. Um, Valuation methodologies for mobile gaming studios have all been about a top-down approach. Um, you know, people are looking at revenue multiples, EBITDA multiples, uh, comparisons in the market. Well, my company's worth this, therefore, you know, this company was worth X hundred million, therefore, my company is worth Y hundred million. Now, that's all. That's all great in a kind of frothy bull market when the bankers are talking it all up. But obviously, when everything changes you go from a top-down to a bottom-up methodology. So what we're trying to do here is rather than pull ethereal comparables out of the, um, uh, you know, out of the ether, we're going to start with you know, some valuation components that can provide you know, tangible, demonstrable value. And you can always talk up as well. So um, the things we're going to focus on here are cohorts. How much, is, how much value is trapped in your existing cohorts? Uh, we're, going to be able to, we're going to look at cash, how much cash is actually in the business and how good is the, uh, the business's ability to generate cash. Um, and then there's obviously a bunch of intangibles as well. So these, this is company-centric as opposed to market-centric uh, approach of how we're, going to, how we're going to look at it. So <clears throat> back to another early economics lesson. Everything is a DCF. So DCF is discounted cash flow. Uh, there's a definition of it. Um, so what you would normally do in a sort of, if you were a bunch of bankers valuing a publicly listed company, you would look at all the expected cash flows of that company over a reasonable period of time, and you would basically discount them back to a number that it's actually worth today, based on sort of tangible uh, forecasts and so on as well. Now, that doesn't really apply to early stage businesses, at seed or, or, or series A, because most of it is all hope and pray value generated from uh, generated from you know expectation. So if you're a, you know if you're raising a Series A to go and address some really important problem in the world, whatever, and, and there's you know there's a potentially billion dollar market for it, whatever, that's great. But it's it's very hard to put discounted cash flow analysis on that, which is why these companies get funded with venture capital instead of instead of debt. But if you look at a mobile gaming studio. Yes, there's lots of risk around, you know, will the game work, will it not work, whatever. But you've got this sort of microcosm here of when you start to do user acquisition, you've got some predictability, no matter how small, about what it's actually going to be worth. So when you've actually got some cash flows and some metrics, you've got, this, you've got the starting point of being able to do a kind of more rational financial analysis. Um, <clears throat> so framework component one. We're going to look at the value of your existing user cohorts. So probably the easiest way to think about this is all that money you've been spending on UA for weeks or months or years. Let's say you press stop on all user acquisition today, um, organic and paid. Tr let's try and figure out, basically, provided you keep the lights on, uh, there's enough content in the game, etc. how much expected value is in these existing cohorts before, theoretically, the last player would, uh, would leave and, and turn the lights off. Um, so we're going to look at it, um, and again, this is just a simplification, but effectively the stacked cohort. So what we're looking at doing is 
building up uh, cohort analysis over time is super important to, to, uh, to conduct this analysis on a cohort basis, effectively stacking them up. So the highest one there is basically, let's say that's today, and we're expecting then this long tail of value to go um, out over a period of time. Now, <clears throat> this is where the, the duration of the, the LTV duration of the game, <clears throat> excuse me, is super important. If you have a hyper casual game, those existing cohorts are dead in 30 days. If you've got a, you know, a merge game that people are enjoying playing, you might be thinking about that in like a two year time horizon. If you're on social casino, you might be thinking that on a three year time horizon. So the expected runoff and long tail value is gonna be very uh, genre de dependent. Um, <clears throat> so two big things that go into that then are how much have you actually spent on UA? You know, you can, have a, you can have a great sort of expected projection, whatever, but what we're trying to figure out is how much is trapped in the flywheel. So, so for, a long, for a long ROAS break even, where it takes you, say, nine to 12 months to break even on the UA in the game, you're investing a lot of money into that flywheel before it starts to actually generate some, um, some, some real revenue. So, you know, we see some of these games, you know, have millions of dollars invested before their first cohort is even projected to break even. So the inertia and the flywheel, that's what we're trying to that's what we're trying to figure out. And then again we just touched on it, the um the LTV of the game is 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 super super uh, important here. So, you know, short residuals, hyper casual, snackable games has got very, very little value, which is one of the reasons you don't really see hyper casual studios. Uh, being acquired. You may see hyper-casual publishers being acquired if they've got a good deal flow, but hyper-casual studios themselves, they're just super dependent on their next hit, so there's no predictable long-term value drivers there. <clears throat> so next one. It's basically about the UA machine. How efficient is it? How scalable is it? Um, and how can we ascribe some, kind of some value to this? Um, so what we think about, again, is just is, is UA... We always think about it in a in a in a three stage process. First of all, do you have a UA machine? Do you have a uh, a, a user acquisition framework where you can put in a dollar and you can get more than a dollar out in a repeatable, somewhat scalable way? And that's the challenge where obviously most people fall down. Um, <clears throat> and then if you have that machine, you've got to figure out how and where you're going to fund it. And then it's at a certain point, that machine will be running at what we think of as full capacity, where you just can't acquire any more users profitably. Uh, and that's very kind of um, genre dependent. So here's, a, here's an example of a of a uh, like a maybe a merge or puzzle game it's got a five dollar acquisition cost it breaks even after nine months goes on to make an eight dollar ltv after two years so it's generating three dollars of net profit um, over a two-year period which is a 60 percent return now you break it down so you've got an annual return of 30 percent you've got a monthly return on capital of a bit low a bit less than three percent so it's really important to break it down and understand the time frame of how long it takes uh, most people just <clears throat> talk about ROAS and LTV and so on as, as ethereal numbers but without the context of time it's very very uh, difficult to measure the returns so we want to plot out our LTV curve. We want, to, we want to map out what the key points are, how much in, when do we break even, how much out, and how long does the whole process take. So that's basically our, you know, what our UA machine's like. Now, um, what I'm looking at here in terms of evaluation is like, okay, I look at the, I look at the, the return profile. So let's say we were making 3% per month. Now, if I need capital to scale this, typically you would look on what it's going to cost you. Now, you may have equity funding, <clears throat> but you may use debt financing. It's easiest to work on it on a debt financing basis. So let's say you can, you can, you can you know, at, at a decent level of scale, you can borrow the money at 1% per month, and then you can invest it at 3% you know, per month, whatever, giving you a 3x return on capital. So you can fund it and pay for it. And then the question is, well, obviously the world has a finite number of players and payers, so how much can you scale that machine before the economics break? So this is where we get back a little bit more towards um, the idea of demand economics, right? So if you think of the CPI here as your supply curve and the LTV is your demand curve. 
So this is, again, just back to economic theory 101, demand and supply. Um, so what happens is as you start to acquire more users uh, for the game, your acquisition costs are going to rise, right? I think everyone knows that. Uh, everyone's been burnt with the golden cohort, the really cheap CPIs, and when you start to scale, the numbers go crazy. So um, it, it, it's something to plan for and to expect. And also the other thing is, the lifetime values are going to uh, fall as you start to scale. So if you think you're going for your, you know, your, your you know, top payers, whatever, because they're so into the IP that's behind your game or whatever, gradually it's going to go out in concentric circles. People are going to be less interested and have a, have a lower propensity to pay over time. So you should expect this, and it's really just a demand and supply um, curve equation that we're looking at. Um, so again, the capacity of the machine, the capacity of the business to generate money through paid user acquisition um, basically comes at the intersection of those curves. That's the economic efficiency, equilibrium, whatever you want to put it. Um, and at that point, you basically, where your acquisition cost is equaling your, uh, your lifetime value, net, of course, of the cost of financing it, then at that point, rationally, you'd, you wouldn't want to do any more uh, user acquisition. So that could be, you know, your equi equilibrium could be $5,000 a day, or it could be $200,000 a day. It's just very different for different genres of game, um, etc. And of course, you have to remember to, um, to factor in time. Um, <clears throat> then the other thing which uh, there's no point getting super technical here, but is convexity of the curve, right? All of these all of these assumptions were just assuming a straight line LTV generation, which of course isn't isn't the case in mobile games. So what you have generally, rather than a straight line, you know, from one dollar to two dollars or whatever the acquisition cost to the to the LTV is, you're going to have some convexity in your curve, meaning that it plays into your favour. The more convex the curve, it just means the more money you're earning more quickly. And then, of course, if you're earning it, then you can redeploy it. So you can redeploy that back into your user acquisition machine over time. Everyone's is going to be different. Um, there's not, it's, not, it's not very easy to, to model formulaically. It's something to just definitely be aware of. Um, <clears throat> then a few other things on that. Obviously, you've got to think of your organic users versus your paid users and treat them, uh, treat them differently. Um, you look at creating a sensible estimate um, based on the historical trend of your ability. So if I've got you know, 20,000 know, new downloads per day just organically because I'm linked to some you know, TV-based IP or something like that, then that's great. You can baseline that and you can you know, project that out into the future um, as long as you don't think it's going you know, to last forever. Um, the other thing, and this is, you, this is putting yourself on the other side of the table here. So this is... Um, when thinking about a potential acquirer, you might be a small startup. You might be a much higher. You much have a much higher cost of capital. But if you're the acquirer, like if you get bought by a massive public company who's got a very low cost of capital, that's the number to be focusing on. How could they finance? How would they look at financing user acquisition, and what returns could they make? Because if you've got a cost of capital of you know, you know, twelve percent a year, and they've got a cost of capital of eight percent or six percent a year. <clears throat> they're going to be able to put more money into this equation. So that would be how you would think about valuing it. And then, of course, you've got to factor in volatility, seasonality. Uh, this is not a linear, scalable thing. So you're going to have these, these um, uh, the, the shape of your demand curve and supply curve is going to be, is going to be changing over time. Um, so it's really important to, um, to think about providing a buffer zone or some haircut uh, when you're thinking about the returns that, of your user acquisition machine as you're pricing it. Um, <clears throat> and then here's where I'm going to be a little bit controversial, right? So there's, you know, there's the two components. You've got your residuals, you've got your machine, and then you've got everything else. And I'm going to bucket that um, slightly disingenuously, perhaps, but I'm going to bucket that all into just one other bucket, and I'm going to tell you why. So if I'm a financial buyer of a game, really what I'm buying is that game's cash flows uh, and streams. So there are lots of other things that make up a gaming company, of course. Um, but if I'm, a, if I'm looking at through the lens of a purely financial buyer, what I'm buying is that, that game's ability or that, that suite of game's ability to generate cash, and this is what I'm going to pay for it, and this is why. 
there's a bunch of other things. So first of all, is like you know the the value of the first party data. If I've got you know n million DAUs or hundred thousand DAUs or whatever it may be, there's some value here around cross promotion. If I can promote other games in that, so I can ascribe some value to that for sure. <clears throat> the other thing is like more controversially, team and culture. Of course, no one wants to acquire a company who has a poor, you know, a poor culture or a crappy team, or whatever. But let's not forget, it's very very difficult to make financial decisions in terms of acquiring a company based on how good the team is because like look at some of the biggest you know companies in the world they just can't knock out hit after hit after hit you know even the supercells this world have resorted to you know um investing in and acquiring other companies because they couldn't just generate um the, the same sorts of successes as they had in in the early days so of course a team is important you don't and you want a team to be able to deliver the financial returns but you know your ability to you know that's more of vc territory right if you're going to like bet on a great team to make a great game there's a lot more risk associated with it Brand presence, you know, people do different different levels of investment into, you know, creating their own kind of brand values and stuff. Uh, and some some people, um, I, I thought, did a did a great job. People like seriously when they were building their brand, it wasn't just about the games; it was everything around it. They did a super good job of that. Um, and then actually, you know, there's uh, the opportunity to leverage, right? So if you were to be acquired, have you created some intellectual property that you could, you know, go and do a Rovio on and merchandise and create sort of secondary or tertiary revenue streams and monetize the IP you've created in different ways? Um, and then also sometimes you look what's been created within the company. Sometimes, you know, very often, tools are created in a company that have a lot of value or could have a lot of value externally. They've just been built to solve a problem. I mean, that's how Slack came about in the first place. It was never as a corporate messaging tool, just to solve uh, solve kind of remote working um, issues and so on. And you know, very you know, very often user acquisition, automation, analytics, attribution, all these things are homegrown. So is it you know, you can look at that and say, well, look, there's all this intellectual property here that could be commercialized in a different way. You also got to think about what it costs you to continue to run the company. So have you got some kind of like evergreen content stream? which is like, you know, let's say there's new music being released into a music game where you don't have to create the music because it's just, it's evergreen. So your content production costs are pretty low versus like a puzzle game or a merge game where you're constantly having to invest and dream up and have, you know, teams creating these, these longer term um, content streams. And then also you've got the, the wider kind of behavioral trends of, you know, what people play, what games are in or out, the, 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 the market um, sentiment stuff. So these are all valid things to put into your model, but there it's, it's harder to price. It's harder to put a number on and hand on heart say, no, it's worth this because of that, right? It's much, much more subjective. So what we've been doing is really like looking at these things the, you know the value of existing users i can you know i can build a model and i can come up with a number and i can hand on heart have some defensibility about that number so that's where we start in terms of deciding what the company's worth number two is like how much can i put in and when do the economics break on my user acquisition machine and then so i can i can say okay over the next three years we can spend this much on ua profitably generating this return i can put you know puts a high degree of probability around that <clears throat> and then of course i can lump everything else in uh, as well and i can have you know i can try and talk up the value of my internal tools and my cross promo and all these other things but it's harder to put a tangible financial um, value in. So you put all these things together and then you come up with something that you can sit in front of the, you know, a potential acquirer and say, we think our business is worth this because of that. It's going to be harder for them to, you know, to talk it down if you were talk if you're coming up with some material, you know, well thought through uh, use cases to articulate um, what the business is actually worth. Um, so that's all I wanted to cover off um, in the talk. Uh, I don't know if anyone's got any uh, any questions. I don't know, Mikhail, how, how are we doing for time? We've got a few minutes. Um, if anyone's got any questions on that methodology or approach. No? Okay. Well, you can come and find. I'm going to be around for the rest of the afternoon. If anyone wants to ask me anything offline or uh, shoot any ideas around, I'm going to be around. Um, thank you very much for your time. <laughs>